good to see everybody this morning. Hope you had a good New Year's. Man, I'm telling you, that those days being on Wednesdays, that messes me up. I don't know about you. Anybody else messed up? It feels like it's two weeks, right? That's just how I feel. But anyway, well, we're excited that you're here this morning at Cross Point. We've got some exciting things happening, especially today. We've got Ethan Blalick. Ethan, where are you? Right here in front of me. Come on up, brother. This is Ethan. Ethan, we have been searching, going through resumes and, uh, with our search team for the last, oh gosh, five months. And uh, we have whittled them all down to now we have Ethan here, and he uh, taught the teenagers this morning. So I want him to introduce himself, tell, him, uh, uh, tell you guys his testimony, a call to ministry. And uh, so just let him be able to talk. So Ethan, you go ahead. All right. Uh, like you said, my name is Ethan Blalack. Um, I am from Hardy, well, I'm, I'm 24 years old. Uh, I'm from Hardy, Arkansas. How many people know where that's at? Wow, actually, that's quite a few. Okay, uh, Spring River, so if you guys know a little bit. Um, middle of nowhere, uh, about 45 minutes north of Batesville, for everybody who doesn't know. Um, there's nothing there, but uh, I, I always kind of enjoyed living in the middle of nowhere. I'm very uh, country for the most part, I guess you could say. Um, I like uh, some of my hobbies. I like to hang out with my dogs, um, which I know sounds weird. You guys think I don't have friends now? But uh, no, I like to hang out with my two dogs, Baron Shadow, Golden Retriever, Border Collie. Um, take them swimming. And I, I love that dog. He's the, Bear is the goofiest dog ever. Keeps me going, too. Um, the reason I have Shadow for the most part is because of my girlfriend right here, Sydney. Um, Sydney, when you wave at him. That's Sydney, everybody. Um, she, um, uh, she, my dog came up to, I work at Lens Auto Glass currently, full time, and the dog showed up at work one day, and it was limping, and she worked right beside, in the business right beside the, where I work, and I said, oh great, I got me another dog now, and, uh, I went out there to the road, it was out by the road, picked it up, brought it inside, sweetest dog ever, she was scared of her shadow, that's how she became shadow. But uh, that, that explains a lot of, of what I do. I spend a lot of time with my dogs, a lot of time with Sydney. Um, love basketball, baseball, football, really any sport. Uh, woodworking, I love to do woodworking. Makes me sound like an old man, but I love to do woodworking. My, my parents got me a wood lay for Christmas. That was what I asked for. I, you know, I said, you know, I would love a wood lay. I love to turn wood, or try to. We'll see. You guys will see me in some cast or something. I'll break something, but we'll see. Um, my, uh, my family, they were going to come today and I said, you know what, you guys lay off on that because we don't know how this is going to go. Uh, I'm not the best public speaker, but we're, we're working on confidence. Brother Matt here has already instilled quite a bit in me and already taught me more than, you know, I can, I can thank him for. Um, my, my testimony goes a little bit like this. I, I was saved whenever I was eight, nine years old, about I was nine years old. I went to a church, uh, Southern Baptist, for my entire life, and whenever I was nine, our preacher was preaching, and, you know, every, I think everybody knows this that is saved. I thought he was talking to me, you know? I, I thought, I was like, man, either the gates of hell are about to open up and swallow me in, or something's about to happen. I got to get up there, and I, I did. I felt convicted, and, and I was saved that day. I was nine years old, I was always a pretty good kid, so I can't say I was just like, oh, I was a drug dealer, and then I stopped, and now look at me. But I can say I was, I was such a worrier, and I still am, I'm, I'm a worrier, but I was just, it was sickening, it was unhealthy. I would worry about school, even at that age, and I would say, you know what, I think we're going to have a test the first day back from Christmas break. I did it every year, and we never did. And every year I'd go, Mom, there's going to be a test. I'm, I can't go. And I'd make myself sick so I didn't have to go to school. I would literally throw up because I'd make myself so sick and nauseous. Well, after I was saved, you know, I had that reassurance. And I, I realized there were more important things in life than me making a bad grade on our test or having a test. And I didn't even make bad grades. That was the, that was the funny thing. Um, I, I graduated from UCA uh, about a month ago, and so did Sydney. Um, that's, that's why I'm down, down here in, in Greenbrier, Conway area. But I also pastor at a church here in, uh, here in Greenbrier, currently, uh, part-time. Um, 
I love the area of Greenbrier. I, I would like to, to stay here as long as the Lord is willing. You know, you never know what the future holds, but I would, I would love to live here my entire life. Sydney grew up here. Her family grew up here. Her dad, uh, some of you may know him. His name is Tom Smith, passed away several years ago of cancer. Great guy. He was a youth pastor, did a little bit of everything. Great guy. And, you know, I wouldn't mind having a testimony like his. I plan to do ministry, you know, as long as the Lord allows me to, but I wouldn't mind having a testimony just like his. Being in the Greenbrier area, I love the people. I, I love kids. I love, I'm very passionate about our, our schools, and we're very lucky. Greenbrier is very, very lucky to be as open as they are to letting people come in. Uh, I think, what's, what's the name of the program? What is it? Mighty Men. And Iron Mighty Men. Men. Yes, Mighty Men. Uh, I've never had an opportunity to speak at Mighty Men, but um, I know that I know the brother uh, has, and I would love to to be able to get more involved in our schools and and definitely have more more activities at our schools, even more programs. Um, my my call to ministry, Sydney's Sydney's father, like I said, he he um, lived in this area. He passed away about five years ago of cancer. Whenever I first started dating Sydney, we were seniors in high school. She told me about her dad that he had stage four cancer, and I, I knew that. And he had had, you know, very serious cancer for a long time. But that man, you know, he was the example of of positivity and how to live even through hardship. And I wouldn't mind, you know, that being my life story. And it really pushed me to ministry, watching the way that he acted and the way that he handled things, it, it pushed me towards that. And that hardship and watching how much it hurt Sydney and, and watching her just struggle through that and struggling with her through that, it, it pushed me to the point of, you know, what am, I, what am I really doing with my life and what's important? And I was going to college, I wanted to be a physical therapist and I wanted to make a lot of money. And that was what I wanted whenever I was my first year of college. And I was like, man, that's going to be so cool, having a nice house and a, and a beautiful family and all that. And I realized that's not what I wanted and that's not important. Those things are okay. I'm not speaking against that. Those things are okay. But that was not what God was wanting me to do with my life. He was calling me to ministry. And I'm terrified of public speaking. Let, let's just be honest, I am. And it's gotten so much better because I've gotten more peace with God. But I knew I was called to ministry. And I, whenever I figured it out, I thought, oh, crap. I was, man, I'm really in for it. I was like, man, I, I can't speak. I can't do anything. But I've learned it's not a reliance on myself, but it's a reliance on God. And that is what really has given me the peace. Me at 14 years old, the, the thought of getting up in front of anyone and speaking, I couldn't even speak to someone if they were right in front of me and look them in the eye. I was just so embarrassed of just everything. The, if you had told me that at 14 years old, I would have said, you're crazy. But I'm just trying to do what the Lord has asked me to do. I, I think that, that Cross Point would be an excellent fit. Um, I, I see the, the demographics here, and we had a, I, I feel as though we had a very good time um, upstairs, very good Bible study Sunday school. Um, I love Jeremy, great guy. We, we had done some stuff. Um, I'm at, have you said where I'm from, which church? I won't say it then. Um, <laughs> I'll leave that, leave that be. You guys will Facebook stalk me later and figure it out. It's, it's B-L-A-L-A-C-K. I already know you guys are going to do it. So You probably are right now. Uh, who is this guy that's talking? No. Um, we had done some stuff through community work, and, and I want to do more of that. And I would love to be more connected with even more churches. Uh, I think that's really the only way we're going to really get into the schools and, and really talk to our kids, our youth, and even beyond that, you know, older people. We, one church is not going to be able to cover this wide of an area and this population. Um, especially with Conway right beside us, Greenbrier is growing every day, and, and this is a growing church. Um, and I want to see more growth. I want to see more young people. I want us to get into the schools. Uh, my vision is, is to see that, that all young people at least have the opportunity to hear the gospel. It's amazing to me, Green, you know, Greenbrier's Community of the Year, all that kids are still not hearing the gospel and 
I feel like that falls on our shoulders. Let, let's get out there. Let's do more. We can do more. I'm not saying we don't do, and we don't do to the best with what we have, but we can do more. And I'm talking as a community, not just a church. And I want to see that. And I, I think at cross point with the resources that you guys have here and the potential that we could reach even more and, and do even more. And it's not anything that I can do. It, it's what God can do through all of us. I just I think that we could all grow together as a family um, and definitely grow with the Lord. Um, and that's I guess that's the end of my, my spill here. All right. Uh, oh, 430. Are you yeah. about to say that? Oh, wait, I was, yeah, I was going to talk about that. I'm going to let him talk. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, Ethan. Good job. Yeah, tonight we'll have a, a, a kind of a get-together time, question and answer a little bit with some of our teenagers, not some of all of our teenagers, all of our parents. We want you to come to that tonight, and uh, we'll have more time to be able to meet with Ethan and, and uh, Sydney and be able to hang out with them and get to know them better. But I just wanted him to get up, get up and give a little announcement that tonight we'll have our members meeting. We'll vote on Ethan, and we've got a couple other housekeeping things to be able to do as well. But I encourage you to be here at 4.30 to 5.30, and then we'll be again at 6 and have that tonight. So just wanted to do those things, and we're excited about Ethan and Sydney coming, and uh, we're excited about them and what they're going to do with our ministry here, with our not only just our youth ministry, our churches as a, as a whole. And a, you can see the, the energy and the excitement and the vision that I think that the Lord has placed in his heart, and we're excited about that. So be praying with us through the rest of this day, and uh, we'll see where the Lord leads, okay? Well, has anybody ever went treasure hunting? Anybody ever been treasure hunting before? You know, okay, we got one. Amber, you go treasure hunting? Uh, what, at the, at the uh, antique malls? Yeah, no, okay. <laughs> but I, I love treasure hunting. Have you guys ever got like the metal detector out and, you know, try to find things? I, I never really got a metal detector, but I remember finding a little Hot Wheel car buried in the mud one time in my backyard. That's the extent of my Indiana Jones adventures, okay? But it is so interesting to be able to find buried treasure. I love seeing those stories, hearing those stories, the, the hunt, the dig, the find. I found this story. Uh, it was about a, a guy in England. His name was Peter Waltlig. Uh, a tenant farmer in Suffolk, England, he lost his hammer somewhere in the field. And, and so not buried treasure, not even treasure at all. He just wanted to find his tool. So he asked his friend Eric Laws to come over with his metal detector. And so he brings his, his machine out to the field to search for it. And the metal detector started buzzing over a particular plot of ground. And instead of finding uh, Peter's hammer, they found a silver spoon, like a real silver spoon. And so they started digging further, and these two men discovered um, even more items. There was gold jewelry, antique coins. And so they're wondering if they had found something historical, archaeological, significant. So they, lo they uh, notified the local authorities, and they came over, and they started doing this dig. And, they, and it, this dig actually became known as the Ho Hoxon Horde. So Hoxon is a village in, uh, in the England area, uh, and it's where it was found. And they found that this treasure they found was from the late Roman era, about the 5th century A.D. And so they found 15,000 coins in this treasure, about 100 spoons and ladles, 29 pieces of gold jewelry, silver vases, beakers and bowls, a pepper pot, which was the forerunner to a pepper shaker, and they did find Peter's hammer as well. So they did find that. But they said judging from that, it was around the 5th century A.D. And it actually coincides with this uh, upheaval of Rome uh, up in that area. Because they, and some of the coins they found, Constantine the II's uh, picture on them. So a very valuable find. And, and it was actually in a, an oak box buried, and it was all stacked nice and neat. So somebody put a lot of time and, and uh, thought into burying this, hopefully to find it later. But finding something valuable like that by chance, I mean, they were just looking for a hammer. And they found this amazing archaeological find. Uh, the treasure like that find, is, it's, it's awesome to be able to do those things. And the reason they found it is because they were put forth the effort to dig something up. They were trying to find a hammer that was just laying in the thick grass, but they wound up finding something even more valuable, as they, and they were able to dig it up, and they found even more. As we start this new year, I always like to do a message series on stewardship. And stewardship is just management. It's, it's a fancy word for managing. We manage our money, manage our lives, manage our relationships, our relationship with God, uh, maybe even managing our, our, uh, our health. Probably the two most serious ones we get at the beginning of the year is our health and our finances, right? 
Uh, we we want to get physically healthy. We want to get financially healthy. That's where we see the gyms. They're packed at the beginning of the year. Or maybe at our house, we dust off the treadmill or we take the clothes off uh, off the hangers, off the, the elliptical. That's at my house. Um, or we, you know, we, we pull the weight bench out from hiding and be able to start using that. Or we start to diet and then we, we post on Facebook all of our dieting progress, right? Letting everybody know how much weight we're losing and we're looking at it it's like, oh, you know, I can't believe they're doing that. And it, because we feel guilty about our weight. Anyway, we try to manage better what we have and what we've been given. And it's good to be a good steward, to be a better steward of the things that we have in our life and really what matters most, what, ne- what we need to be focused on. And we've all been there where we know that we need to change, right? Knowing we need to manage better, maybe it's our diet, could be our attitude, maybe even our spiritual walk, right? We're here at church. A lot of you are here today. It was the first, day, first Sunday of the year, so we're going to get back into church. We're going to go to church, and that's good. I'm glad you're here because we need to be here. But have you ever felt the pressure and the angst, right? You know, of all those things, maybe in your room and you're picking something up off the floor and you kind of grunt to pick it up and you look over and maybe you have a full length mirror in your room and you look over and you catch a glimpse of yourself. You're like, oh my goodness, right? You see the realness in that moment. You're like, oh, you see the love handles. You're like, that's not me. No, you look at that extra chin. You're like, who is this? Right? We took pictures the other day. I should have put the picture up here. I was throwing Olivia up, and, and, and we got a great picture of her up in the sky, blue sky behind, and it's the back of my head. And I'm looking, and the sun was shining really bright that day, and I'm looking at this picture. I'm like, oh, who is that? I do not have that much gray hair, right? It was, it was like a silver. I told Jamie she had to start calling me the silver fox. But, you know, it was, a, it was so much, but I, was, I think it was just the sun. But anyway, we see those things in the mirror, and we're like, man, you know, they take that deep, longer look. You're like, that's not really me. But you see that love handles and that chin, and you're like, man, I've got to do something, right? It's kind of like the hammer that was lost. The guy was looking for the hammer, and just like you, you might have been looking just to pick up that sock, Instead of finding the hammer, he found a treasure, right? Instead of just picking up that sock, you found a treasure. You see those love hands, you see that extra chin, and you're like, Pastor Matt, that's no treasure, you know? But it is, because you saw the real. You saw the unfiltered person. It might not be your weight. It could be your finances. As the bills start to come in after Christmas, and you're like, oh, my goodness, right? We see the realness. And really, it's a treasure, Maybe it might be your yearly review at work and the report's not as flattering as you thought it was going to be. Could be the dust on your Bible or that Bible study that you bought a year ago that you were going to do and it's still sitting there not finished. That devotional book that you bought last year that you were going to read with your family to have time with them and you haven't. You say, Pastor, those are no treasures at all. They're tragic. But they are treasures because now you see them. Because now you're aware of them and you can make better on what you were going to do. Take action and change. Become the better steward of what you have in your hand. What God has given you. The life and the responsibility that God has given you. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 25. Now it's a very familiar passage. Parable of the talents. You've probably heard messages on it before. I know I've probably spoken on it even since I've been here. But I want us to look at this passage today and over the next few weeks and really break it down and find the nuggets, the gold nuggets, that treasure that's within it. So Matthew chapter 25, we're going to start in verse number 14, and it'll be on the screen up here as well. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And one of, the, one of he gave five talents to, another two, and another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went off on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And verse 20 says, And so he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered unto me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then verse 24. 
Then he who, he who received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathered where you have not scattered seed, and I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there is what you have, what is yours. But the Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reaped where I have not sown and I gathered where I have not scattered seed. So you have ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and my coming I would have received back with my own interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one that had 10 talents. Verse 29, for everyone who has more will be given and he who has an abundance, but for him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast in an unprofitable servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the time to be able to read your word. And Lord, I pray that the study of your word today would be profitable for us. Lord, thank you for Ethan and Sydney being here today. Lord, I pray that you would bless as we meet tonight. And uh, Lord, that you would work through that. And Lord, we thank you for everything that you are going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we have verse 14 tells us about a, uh, what this parable is about. Now, a parable, you guys remember, is a heavenly story with an, or an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So Jesus, who's the master storyteller, tells a story to make a point. And he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. He had just given a story about the ten virgins, and that was a story about preparedness, being prepared. And now he's giving us a story about the stewards, about talents, and about how that preparedness you also need to be producing, and that we need to be doing something. And he's saying this is how the kingdom of God illust uh, operates. He's illustrating how the kingdom of God operates and, and what's to be expected. Now let's look at the story and see what's happening here. Verse 14, he says, he delivers this, this Lord, this boss, delivers goods to them. He gave them something of value, something worth having. Now, verse 15, we see him dividing up those things to his workers. And he, gives, he has three workers here. He gives one guy five talents. Now, what's a talent? Well, a talent is actually a measurement of weight. But usually it was a measurement of weight of gold, silver, or copper. So very, very valuable. A talent would be considered... Um, about a half a lifetime. You think about your lifetime and what you make in salary. It's about a half of lifetime of salary. And so you think about what you've made over the years. If you're retired, think about what you've made in the past, and you get half of that all at once. That's what these guys are getting. This first guy, he gets five of those. The second guy gets two, and the last guy gets one. So if you look at that and you add it up in our current value today, I mean, this is about $100 million worth of value here. A lot of money that's being handed out to be able to barter with, to be able to buy and sell with. Now, we think about, I say $100 million, and we hear that word today, millions and billions and trillions, whenever you think about our national debt. Those words get thrown around, usually maybe with CEOs and football players and coaches. That's a lot of money, folks. I don't have a million dollars. I don't know if anybody in here has a million dollars. If you do, I want to talk to you after church, okay? Um, no, but we... That's a, this is a lot of money. This is a lot of money. And for one talent, to have that much money given to you at one time, maybe two or even five, that's a lot of money. But I want, what I want you to see here, money is not the issue. It's not the main issue. It's a part of it, but it's not the main issue. The issue is responsibility. It's responsibility that's given to each one of these guys. Every one of them, they're not given the same amount, verse 15 tells us. It was according to their ability, and that's key. It was according to what they were able to handle, the, what the boss saw in them, what they had the potential to do. And so he distributes all this money, and then he heads out. It doesn't say for how long, but it is for a long time, because there's trading and there's earnings happening during this time period. Verse 16 then tells us that one of the guys had five talents. That's a lot of responsibility, a lot of finances. What does he do with it? It says that he goes out, and he buys low, sells high, right? And he builds a relationship within the community, and he makes more, he gains five more talents. Verse 17, the one with two talents does the same thing. Both of them double what they've been given. The same drive, same attitude, same results. One guy now has 10, this guy has four. And then we have in verse 18, the one that had one talent was given to him. Now this is still a lot of money, a lot of money half a lifetimes of wages, a ton of money, a lot of responsibility, even though it's one talent, it's still a lot of responsibility. What does he do? He digs a hole in the ground, puts the money in there, buries it, just like those spoons and those gold coins that somebody did back in the fifth century, buried that. 
and leaves it there for the duration that his boss is gone, then what happens? Verse 19, the boss comes back. As the Bible says, to settle accounts. Now again, this is a earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The, the, the heavenly meaning of this is this is talking about Christ is going to return one day. Ethan talked about the gospel and that every teenager, every young person needs to hear the gospel. Every person in this town needs to hear the gospel. And the gospel is simply this, that Jesus came and died for our sins, that he came to this earth, lived a sinless, perfect life, and then he died for my sin and your sins so that we could be forgiven of our sins. He took our penalty for our sin so that we can be able to have forgiveness and be able to live with God forever. He died and then he rose again. That's what gives us power over sin because he defeated death for us. And that's what this is talking about. If you know Christ as your Savior, there is one day, even if you don't know him as your Savior, one day Christ is going to return. He's going to come back and settle accounts. And that's what this is talking about. What are you going to be able to tell him? What are you going to tell him? What are you going to be able to say to him whenever he returns? Because whenever we have to give an account, this is called the judgment seat of Christ for Christians, where he's going to take for us what it, we, he's been given us time. What time, what, what do we use our time for? We only get 24 hours a day, right? What do we use that time for? Our talents, our abilities and our gifts, our treasure, our finances, even the gospel, the good news that you've received, what did you do once you had it? Did you just hold it for yourself? Or did you share it with others so they could know? They could have what you have. So the story here is to get us to have a sense of urgency that God could come back at any time and to use, be good stewards of what God has given us while we live this life now. Verse 20 through 23, we see guy number that had five talents and the guy that had two talents, they show that they doubled what they had had, what they had been given, and he commends them. He says, good job, well done, thou good and faithful servant. More about them in a couple of weeks. But verse 24 the guy with one town is what I want to focus on today. Look at verse 24. What does he say? Then who received the one town? What's the first thing? Lord, I knew you were a hard man. Man, he starts right in with the excuses, right? Now, let me just, you know, he's like, hold on. I know you're a hard man. He starts giving excuses about what he had already done. He knew what he did was wrong. He knew what he had done with those things was not what God, what, what God or what that boss wanted him to do with it. I was wondering if he stands there and sees the other guys give double back to what they had already had stewardship over. You think about what those guys had. They, now, those guys had different amounts, but they did the same job with what they had been given. They doubled what they had been given. They worked it and they doubled it. And now he's looking at his one talent that he's dug up out of the ground, probably still has dirt falling off of He's probably like, you know, holding that bag, dusting it off. It's like... Here it is. It's back what, I, what you gave me. It's, it's just like you gave it to me. I know it's a little dirty. It's okay. It's just like you gave it to me, right? Probably trying to think, you know, look at verse 25. It says, I was afraid. He says, I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. And he says, look what you have here. It's yours, just like you gave it to me. No harm, no foul, right? Well, there is, because that's not what God expected. That's not what the master wanted from him. Do you know that our English word, talent, is derived from this very story? Michael J. Wilkins is a scholar. He says this, talent refers to the natural endowments of a person. Talent symbolizes the giftedness that is bestowed on each person who is graced with the kingdom life. That's what a talent is, is what we have, what God has given us. Now, we know in this account, it's talking about a, a weight, but we can use that and apply that for us and what God has given us. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 7, that we are given gifts of the Spirit, not just for ourselves. What does it say? For the profit of all. What you have, what God has given you, is not just for you. It's to, for you to share with everybody, to be able to help everybody. Whatever your talent or your ability, whatever the spiritual gift that you have is for God, wants you to use it for Him, for others not just for you. I'm sure the two that had their talents used them, those other two, the five and the two guy, they used their talents out in the marketplace. And not only did they use them to, to buy and sell and make gain, but they were boosting the economy as well. They were doing practical things, not only doing what their, their boss, what the Lord told them to do, but they were also helping as they used their talents out in the community practically with this story they're boosting the economy 
You think about your talents and your abilities that God has given you. How could you use those to boost the economy? Maybe not financially, but socially, emotionally, and most importantly, spiritually. How God can be able to use you guys, use me, use this church to be able to do that. These guys, they invested and they were given a return. But here's the thing. We know if any of you guys have made any investments, there's always risk with your investments, right? We always got to balance the risk versus reward. Are we going to be aggressive in our investments? Are we going to kind of pull back because those risks are there? What if the stock market crashes again? What if we have another 2008, right? What if we have another 1930s where we have the depression? There's always that risk. The risk overpowered the guy with one talent. And fear set in. The risk was too much. Let's see again in verse 25. He says, I was afraid. He says, I was afraid. Fear could be dangerous. Now, I can say, I, I do want to say this. The appropriate amount of fear can be motivating. Me, there's a, the appropriate amount of fear can be motivating. Look at the guys with five talents and two talents. They knew the same thing about the boss and about the master that the guy with one talent said. They knew the same thing. But that fear, what did it do? That knowledge, it drove them to work. It drove them to produce. And it would drove them to know what was expected. And that's what they did. We don't see any instruction, double what I gave you. It doesn't say that there. Now, we assume that there's to be, to be production because he gave them the responsibility From the response of the guy with five talents and two talents, they produced. And so it's an understood thing that they were supposed to produce. We even see the expectation with the guy with one talent. In his description of the boss, right? That he reaps and that he gathers. He's expected to receive something. But that expectation for him led to fear. Why do you think he was fearful? Why do you think he was fearful? Do you think maybe whenever they were distributing you know the the boss is giving out the different talents and the guy with one talent's watching the guy with five get five then the other guy to get two and then he comes to him and gives him one and he's probably like (laughs) one that's all i get right maybe he feels a little inferior he's got an inferiority complex now because those guys got more than him because it said according to their abilities like well he doesn't think i have a whole lot of ability but you think about That dude just got a half a lifetime of salary, of money. That's a huge responsibility, but what is he focused on? Well, I don't have as much as them, right? What you have, God has given you. And it is awesome, whether it's your finances, your job, your family. I know I feel guilty sometimes. We've had Olivia now for nine months, and she is a huge blessing. And I'll be honest with you, there are times where I'm like, oh my goodness, if she wasn't here, I could do this and I could do that. And I feel so guilty. Because God has blessed me with a little one. And I'm old and I'm tired. Jamie's tired. But God has blessed us with her. And I've had to make myself on purpose not think that way. Because I can start thinking that way and that's selfish. And that's what I think was happening right here with this guy. He was selfish, he was fearful, thinking about what everybody else had. Why did they get that? Don't we think that way sometimes? They don't deserve that, right? They don't even appreciate it. The house that they have, the car that they have, the job. I wish I had their job. They don't even appreciate it. Even the spouse, man, they're married to him. They're married to her. The resources. You might say, well, if I had what they had, I could do this or that. If I had more money, if if I had their job, I could have that money that they've got, right? Well, there's probably a reason why you don't have that job. You've got to be faithful with what you got right now. I could have a happy marriage if I had their wife, if I had their husband, right? I could be, and you just fill in the blank. I wonder if the one talent guy said, well, if I had done something, I, I, I would have done something if I had more than just one talent. If I had been given at least two like that guy, at least I could have invested the one and kept this one just in case things didn't work out. He's so worried about, if I'm trying to do anything with what I have, he says, I only have the one. If I try to do anything with this one, I'm going to lose it. What if I lose it? Look at the guy with five talents. He says, man, if I had all that he had, if I had that, even just two, he goes, what could I do, right? Does that sound familiar? Maybe, maybe not. 
I've heard those things. If I just had this, I've said those things. I know when I was in Utah, we had a small church. And I'd look around and I was like, man, if I had that church building or if I had that staff, boy, what I could do. I'm guilty of it just as much. We'll be honest. There are times in our lives where we've done that. Somewhere along the way, the five and the two talent guy, though, showed that they could be trusted with more than just one. At one time, those guys started out with one, probably improved themselves. And that's why he gave according to their ability. This guy got two and this guy got five. But they didn't bury their talent. They dug it up and they used it. They kept it out. And that's what I want us to take from this is we have to dig up what God has placed within us. We have to dig up what God has placed within us. We need to get the shovel out and start digging. Because God has given each one of us, each one of you, talents, abilities, dreams, passions, aspirations to use. And more importantly, for Him. We've got to dig it up. God has gifted every one of us in some way. And He wants us to use it for Him. Not just for our own personal gain. Not only gifts and abilities and resources to use for him as well. He's given us so many things. But what can happen over time is those gifts and those abilities, those resources, they can start to get buried. They get buried with the busyness of life. They get buried like the guy with the one talent of fears. Like, I don't know if I can do anything with this. You might have a talent of music. Music's always the one that you think of. You hear about people that they have this hidden talent. They can sing. They can play an instrument. And you're like... What? <laughs> Why are you sitting here, man? We need you up here on the platform, right? Using that talent. Maybe you've got a talent to be able to teach. You've got the talent of hospitality. There's all types of things, but we get those fears of not being good enough or not knowing enough or maybe even the fear of criticism, right? Someone will criticize what you're doing. Someone has maybe criticized you in the past. And you hear them criticize like, that's, you'll never make it. You'll never be able to do anything. That doesn't sound good at all. And so we bury that. We start digging and we're like pushing that down. It's like, I don't even want to mess with that anymore. And it's something that's within us. We bury that hope when we do that. You might have had a parent or a sibling or a teacher, someone that's an authority in your life, that has some say in your life, say that you're just wasting your time. And you've let those words and those thoughts bury those things, those th passions, those talents, those abilities inside of you. You might have even had experiences in your life. Experiences that have proved that things just never work out for me. They do for everybody else, but not for me, right? One author puts it this way. There is no shortage of things in life that can cause you to bury your heart and your soul. There's not a shortage of things. There's so many things out there that can help you bury that. That's what we see here with the guy with one talent. He was saying, I've heard the stories that this guy, this boss is a hard man. I've seen the work, I've experienced, and experience has taught me to be fearful of you. Fearful to the point of paralysis. He probably had that analysis paralysis. You guys ever done that? You start thinking about things so much, you start thinking through everything, and you're like, man, this is not going to work out. You think about all the negative, all the things and how it can go wrong. And then we get that analysis paralysis. We, we wind up doing nothing. Fear seeps in and it hinders us. And we think, what's the point? Jesus has some strong words for this. Look at verse 26. What does it say? It says, he answered him and says, you wicked and lazy servant. Whew. Those are strong words. Those are powerful words that should pierce our hearts. They're hard words to hear, but let me ask you, are they true? When you have taken a hard look at yourself, at your situation, have you been lazy? You say, who cares? I'll do it later. Someone else will do it. <laughs> I love watching this show. Have you guys ever watched Restaurant Impossible? Anybody ever seen that show? That guy, um, my, uh, Irvine, Irvine, I forget his, what's his name? Robert Irvine, yeah. He's big, dude. He is muscle-bound. Uh, but he's a chef, he's former military, but he comes in and helps, you know, restaurants that are dying. I was watching one on Thursday night. That's when the new episodes come out on Thursdays. I love watching this show because I love watching him. He's inspiring. So he comes into this restaurant, this restaurant, this guy, uh, this actually guy used to be a cook in the Navy. 
And so we come in this restaurant, everything, I mean, he's yelling, screaming, the, all the customers can hear him from the kitchen, screaming at the wait staff, food's horrible. So Robert Irvine comes in, you know, he always comes in and surprises them. As he comes in, he starts looking around. He goes, man, he was in the bar. He goes, there's this pink stuff. He goes, that's salmonella. I'm like, oh, I didn't even know that. And he goes, it's just filthy. He goes into the kitchen. He sees the, the vents. They got dust all over them. He pulls back this one thing. He's got cockroaches in there. He's smushing them with a spatula. I'm like, oh, it's gross. And he goes, you knew I was coming. You asked me for help. You knew I was coming. He goes, but yet you didn't clean any of this. And he tells the restaurant, he goes, you're lazy. And I mean, he is in his face. The restaurant owner, he takes his apron off, throws it down, walks outside, telling the producers, take this microphone off of me. I know I called him here. I want to be done. So they start talking to him. They're like, you did call us here. Why did you call us here? They get him to calm down. They get him to see that what he said was true. He was being lazy. And he walked back in and he said, Robert, he goes, everything you said is true. He goes, let's get to work. And that's Robert's f- favorite line. He smashes with a sledgehammer in the beginning. He goes, let's get to work, you know, and with his accent. Is all- but I love that. He said, let's get to work. He said, let's not be lazy. He goes, you're lazy. That's why this all looks like this. You're lazy. What does Jesus say? You're wicked lazy servant that should pierce our hearts what are we doing you think about it, somebody else will do it folks no one else God has given you the responsibility of what he has given you what he has gifted you with with the responsibility that you have he has given it to you God gives you the responsibility in your home of the spouse that you need to be God's given you the responsibility at your home and of the parent that you need to be God's given you the responsibility at home, teenagers, to be the kid and the teenager that you need to be. At your job, at your church, folks, some of you guys have talents and abilities that you can use for God that would help our church to be able to reach more, impact more for God's glory. But we hold back because we're scared. Folks, we've got to dig it up. We have to dig it up. Find out what you're passionate about, what drives you, those things that God wants you to use to grow his kingdom. You remember at the beginning of the passage that we read today, verse 14? What does it say? The kingdom of heaven is like. Folks, we live in the kingdom right now. Jesus came, the king of kings came and started the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Remember we went to the the Sermon on the Mount? We went to the prayer. The Lord's prayer says, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We say, bring up there, down here. That's what we're to do. But we got to dig it up. And he wants to do it through you, but you got to dig up what's inside of you to be able to do that. God wants to use you to grow his kingdom, your talents, your abilities, your time, your treasures to help in the growing. But we've got to dig it up. We've got to dig it up. We've got to dig up the potential, no matter what the situations are. It's to start to dig and to work on it, even if it's just a little bit at a time. There are some people in here that are talented artistically. Use that for God. There are people that have passions for people that are hurting. Let's start to work. We have people in our church that need care. People that are hurting, that are sick, that need prayed for. There are people that have a passion about helping people get out of debt. A passion for good stewardship of finances. And in the coming months, we're going to have those persons with that passion to have a financial peace university. Are you... Financial Peace University small group. We're going to be starting that in a few months to be able to help with these things, to allow them to use their passions, to maybe help get yours out instead of being consumed with debt. Because when we, here's the thing, guys, when we don't dig it up, we're going to lose it. When you don't dig it up, you're going to lose it. That's what happened to the guy with the one talent. We saw in the parable, the guy with the one talent, he, he lost what he had. It was taken from him. See, when we have a gift from God that he's given us, whether it's a talent, a passion, a responsibility, whatever it is, if we leave it buried, it does not matter if you buried it or if someone else buried it. If you leave it there, you will lose it. You guys know I love cars. There's a show called American Hot Rod. It's not on anymore. Boyd Boyd Coddington was the the star of that show. He was a famous designer, car designer, uh, restore. I mean, did amazing things with cars. And he had his show... And in 2007, the, the, uh, Tulsa, the city of Tulsa, they, they had done a time capsule in 1957. 
1957, they, they had a, a company that was trying, you know, that was getting to the height of the Cold War and, and nuclear stuff all. So there was a company that had uh, shelters that they were advertising. They said, we're going to put this 1957 Belvedere in this hole. Go ahead and show this. So they're, they're putting this in, in one of these vaults in one of these shelters. So they put this in there and they put a lot of other things in there from 1957. They're going to leave it sealed for 50 years. Well, <laughs> their vault didn't hold up, all right? And so they unearthed this thing and they asked Boyd Coddington to come because they knew that it was unearthed to see if they could be able to restore this car. And so they put these tarps on them, uh, tried to wrap it up, but it wasn't like Ziploc sealed, okay? So, I mean, it was pretty nasty looking. They pull this out. And then, so go to the next slide there. This is the car when they pull it out. This thing was beautiful when they put it in. That's what it looked once they pulled it out. Boyd Coddington said, it is unrestorable. It is too far gone. It was lost. Folks, when we bury things and we leave them there, they're lost. Maybe 50 years later, you try to dig it up, it's going to look like that. Beyond repair. Beyond than what could be done. That's what happens to our talents and our gifts and our abilities. The opportunities, if we bury them and leave them there, they're going to be gone. They're not there for you to use someday later when you feel like. Or maybe when the time's right. <laughs> when I have this amount of money, when I have this amount, of, it will never happen, right? There will never be enough money. There will never be enough time. You've got to start now. You've got to get up and get after it. As Robert Irvine says, let's get to work, right? You've got to start. You have to dig it up. We've got to get the shovel out and start digging to dig it up. Now, what does it mean to dig it up? Well, for some of you, it might be that you need to make that counseling appointment for your marriage. And to dig it up. That's dig one. It might be getting the budget out and reallocating where your finances are going. It could be to start tithing again. Instead of saying, God, I don't, I, I've got it, this is too much, I've got to do this. No, put God first, and then watch him bless. Only time in the entire Bible of Malachi, God gives a challenge. He says, prove me in this. Test me could be attending the Financial Peace University when we started. could be serving here at church. could be teaching. Just even being a greeter. Nursery. Security. We need that after last week, right? We have a security team. You guys keep praying for that church in Texas. Do you think about coming back into an auditorium where there was a shooting the week before? Folks, we need that. It's important. It could be planning a family night this week with your own family, spending time together, to invest in your kids. That first dig, play a game together, interact. Take a day trip somewhere. Folks, sitting on the couch is not digging, okay? Do something. Get up and start digging. Maybe for you to get that thing that's buried deep inside, it could be enrolling in a class. Maybe finish your degree. Start your degree. Get your master's degree. Maybe you just need to take a class to get some skills to help you dig up that talent, that gift, that passion that's within us. But let me help you be aware of something. When you start to dig, it's not always roses, right? As you dig, you're going to dig up some good and you're going to dig up some bad. Both need to be dealt with. That's the part of the treasure, is to deal with the bad. Because it needs to be dealt with. That's probably why you got it buried, because you don't want to deal with it. But if we would big, dig it up and deal with it, that's the treasure. Because usually the bad is buried with it. And that's why we can't get to the good. It's to dig them both up. Address both of them in the counseling session. As you take the class and you have to balance family, work, and school life. Stretch you and help you to see where you need to grow. That's where the treasure is. When we see the extra chin. <laughs> whenever we see how our spouse looks at us. Because of how we just said something, that's a treasure. Because then you can be able to work on it. It's a gift. We can be able to deal with the bad, grow from it, dig it up and deal with it. Pull that Bible out and start to read it. Folks, you need to be in this book. And there's so many applications now that you can be able to use. version is probably one of the best. Somebody was texting or Facebooking the other day about what could I start. There's a great one about reading through the Bible in a year. And it actually has a devotional that's a video. You don't even have to read it. You just got to watch it. And then there's this different verses that you read throughout the day, each day, every week. 
We've got to get in it. But we have to start. Dr. Cloud says this, he says, your job is to dig it all up. Then do one of two things, to sow it or to throw it away. It's to dig it up, deal with the bad, throw it away, get the good and sow it. Sow it, learn from it, let it flourish. Another quote says, often the biggest sign that tells us of the things that are buried in our hearts is the numbness and the life that is not alive. Think about your life. There are parts of your life where you're numb because you've pushed it down so far you don't even feel it anymore. God wants you to dig those up. He wants you to help those. It's time to dig those up. I want to read you one last verse. Proverbs 28, 19 says, He who works his land will have abundant food, but the one who chases fantasies will have his fill of poverty. Right? He who works the land will have an abundance of food, plenty of bread, right? Tons. What is it saying? If you work, it's going to produce. If you put it to work, it's going to produce. Dig it up, work the land, it will produce. What you're looking for, what God wants us to have, what will expand the kingdom of God. Think about what it would feel like. What it would be like if we dug up that passion. If we dug up that talent, dug up that ability that God has given us and actually used it for him. What would it be? where we operated out of our faith instead of our fear. Put some practical steps to what you want to do and what you desire to do, what you're even gifted to do. I can tell you what you feel. You would feel purposeful. You would have some meaning. There would be empowerment. And that empowerment, it's not just about you doing something. It's about the Holy Spirit, what he's given you to be able to work finally because you dug it up and you're doing what God's asked you to do. There would be hope. There would be a future. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning, and I thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your word that speaks to us. Lord, I pray that there's someone here today that does not know you as their Savior, Lord, that today would be the day of salvation, Lord, to hear your gospel, to know that you came and that you died for us, that you forgave us of our sins on your, with your death on the cross, that you defeated death by resurrecting yourself. And Lord, that same love and that same power can be in our life we'll recognize the sin in our life and ask you to forgive us of our sins. And as 1 John 1, 9 says, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If there's someone here today that needs that, Lord, I pray that they would come and we could show them through your word how to start that relationship with you. But Lord, for the Christian today, Lord, this, this parable is for us of how your kingdom is to operate that you've given us responsibilities, you've given us talents, abilities, treasure, and Lord, we are to use them for you to be good stewards of them. Lord, maybe they've been buried. We've pushed them down because of fear, because of criticism, because of laziness. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to dig them up today. Lord, that you would fire us up, that we would get to work. You'd help us to see that thing and Lord that we would take steps each day and it could be just getting in your word each day to give us that purpose to give us that drive to do what you've called us to do Lord we love you in Jesus name Amen